Greetings in the Lord, and I wish you a blessed feast to the conversion of St. Paul from the St. Paul Center Studios here in Steubenville, Ohio. I want to spend just a few minutes on this special podcast reflecting upon St. Paul and his impact in history, in the church, and especially in our lives. Let's think about St. Paul and his conversion. First of all, we have to step back and recognize that St. Paul is the single most influential writer of all time. Our Lord Jesus would have been if he had written anything, but he didn't. So St. Paul's writings are massive in their influence, but even more than being an influential writer, he is the most thoroughly converted man in all of history. When you look at his conversion, you see three different accounts of it in the book of Acts, chapter 9, chapter 22, and chapter 26. Each one is a little bit more information, and it's fascinating to read them all together. But exactly what do we mean by Paul's conversion? Because it isn't a conversion from atheism to Christianity. It isn't even a conversion from Protestantism to Catholicism like my conversion. You know, I think we have to recognize that Paul is the single greatest convert in history because Saul, the Pharisee, was the single most fervent persecutor in history. This was all part of God's plan for him and for us. You know, God took all of the energy of Saul the Pharisee, the persecutor, who had the authority and the papers from the chief priests of Jerusalem, as we read in Acts 26, to conduct this persecution, rounding them up, imprisoning them, and putting them to death, just like he sort of hosted Stephen's martyrdom there in Acts 7. But he had the authority to do so. But more than the authority, he had this drive. What did God do? Well, he basically took all of that misdirected zeal and reversed it. I call it the rubber band effect. You know, you take a rubber band and the farther you pull it back, when you release it, the faster and the farther it flies. And so you can see how God is harnessing all of that zeal to bring about a conversion. But again, not from one religion to another. Because Saul the Pharisee, the student of Rabbi Gamaliel, the greatest rabbi in Jewish antiquity, believed in the coming Messiah. He was sure that the Christ would come, but he was also sure that Jesus was not the Christ until he met him on the road to Damascus. And he's blinded by a light, and he and the men around him fall to the ground. And he hears the voice in Hebrew saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I can't imagine the bundle of thoughts that must have been rushing through his brain in those seconds falling to the ground, seeing a light brighter than the sun. He knows it's divine. He knows it's from heaven. And then suddenly, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? All he can get out of his mouth is, who are you, Lord? And then, of course, when he hears, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, and the rest of the mission that Jesus has for him, you know, you can you could get a sense of like, wow, I have really been on the wrong road here, you know. I'm reminded of a book that came out back in the early 70s uh, by an author named Moss, his last name. It was called the Valachi Papers. Joseph Valachi was the one who took us from the notion of the mafia, organized crime, to the insider's perspective. And why? Well, because he told us about La Cosa Nostra, which is our thing, because he was an insider. He was a hired hitman. And you know, he, he knew that from his experience that if you ever ended up killing the wrong guy, there was a contract immediately put out on you because the only thing that could potentially awaken the conscience of a professional hitman was killing the wrong guy. And so when Valachi killed a guy in prison and then turned him around and realized, oh, he's not the guy, I killed an innocent man, he basically spilled his guts. He, he told everything that ended up being in this collection of It's called the Valachi Papers. Now, Saul, the Pharisee, would have passed a polygraph. He was sincere in persecuting what he believed to be the followers of Jesus, the false Messiah, until he realized he was totally wrong. And so he was going after the wrong guy. Well, he was going after the followers, but when Jesus says, you know, why are you persecuting me? Another thought that might have been rushing through his mind was, okay, Jesus, you're the Lord, you're the Messiah. I've obviously been profoundly wrong. But what's with this uh, 
you know, taking the persecution a little too personally. What do you mean persecuting you? I've been persecuting your followers, but it's obvious that you identify yourself deeply, closely, radically with them. And of course, that's why later on, Paul is the only New Testament writer to ever speak about the church as the body of Christ, not just an assembly, but members of Christ's own body. And so the seed was sown right there in the moment of his conversion. But again, not a conversion from one religion to another, but a conversion that is described by Paul himself in 2 Corinthians 5. Listen to what he has to say about his own past, judged now from the supernatural awakening that he realized there on the road. In 2 Corinthians 5.16, we read, From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Let me just interrupt for a moment because that, I think, is an inadequate translation. From a human point of view is a rather wordy translation of two Greek terms, kata, sarka, according to the flesh. All right? From now on, therefore, regard no one according to the flesh. No one. Why? Well, even though we once regarded Christ from a human point of view, according to the flesh, he's looking back on his own days as a Pharisee and a persecutor. We regard him thus no longer. Why? Because if anyone is in Christ, he is a kinekatesis. He is a new creation, a brand new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Wow. So there's a certain sense in which you could practice Judaism with your whole heart, but from a natural perspective, with your whole mind, but from a strictly intellectual standpoint. And so Kata Sarka points to the fact that we weren't meant to live the covenant according to the flesh by our own human powers. We were called to open our hearts up to grace, to faith, to the power of the Holy Spirit. And that can happen in a way that is almost entirely voluntary. Or in Saul's case, it can happen in a way that is not only utterly unexpected, but something that represents the opposite of what he was intending to do. I can relate, you know, because though I didn't convert from being a non-Christian to being a Christian, I converted from being an, a Protestant, an evangelical, a fervent Calvinist, and thus, you know, a rather strong anti-Catholic. And it was, you know, conviction that was, you know, if the Eucharist is just a wafer, why are they worshiping it? If the Pope is just a, a sincere teacher, why does he claim to be infallible? You know, if the Blessed Virgin Mary is an amazingly blessed woman, but not the mother of God, not the fullness of grace, then this is Mariolatry. And I would have passed a polygraph. That's why I didn't just disagree. I opposed and I targeted my Catholic friends, not imprisoning them to be sure, but I'm convinced that St. Paul, like an older brother, has paved the way for me because once suddenly you begin to see things, not katasarka, according to the flesh, but katapanuma, according to the spirit, then suddenly it's like, whoa, my goodness. It's like, you know, in a theater, watching a movie, wondering why it's blurry until you realize you haven't put on your 3D spectacles yet. Then suddenly it just comes to life. You know, it's a conversion to be sure, but it's not over and done in the past. It's not a once and for all type of thing. It ends up being ongoing. At least it has been for me over the last 35 years. But I think there's even more proof that it was for Paul something ongoing. There was a flip of the switch and the light from heaven comes on. But if you read Paul's own self-description, you realize looking at the earlier epistles and what he says about himself, and then looking at the epistles at the middle of his own apostolic career, and then contrasting that with what he says about himself at the very end, you might think good, better, best. It's the opposite. There is this deepening of his own humility and this awakening of the mercy of God. So in 1 Corinthians, near the beginning of his own apostolic career, Paul spoke of himself as the least of the apostles in 1 Corinthians 15, 9. And then later on, one of his prison epistles, Ephesians, he says that I'm the least of all the saints, chapter 3, verse 8. 
But in the pastoral epistles near the end of his life, he basically says how Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the foremost of sinners. Notice he doesn't say, I was. He says, I am the foremost of sinners. And you're like, well, that's just apostolic hyperbole, you know, Pauline exaggeration. Well, I think he would have passed a polygraph and gotten a slightly higher grade than when Saul would have been interviewed. You know, this is reminiscent of other saints, too. I'm thinking of St. Francis of Assisi, who by the end of his life has radicalized the ways in which Catholics now can envision living the gospel, the radical gospel, following Christ. And yet, what does he say about himself in the end? The same thing that Paul says. He considers himself the foremost of sinners, and he explains that if anybody else had gotten the grace that I was given, they would have been far more farther along. And so I, I want to underscore not only that Paul is the most thoroughly converted Christian of all time, but the conversion was something that was ongoing, ever deepening, lifelong, but also daily. And so we have so much to learn from him about our own lives, not just from his writing, but by his example as well. And I am also convinced that, that we as Catholics have a special need to kind of rediscover Paul, to reread Paul, to reappropriate him in terms of a, of a closer bond. You know, I think back to over 10 years ago, back in 2008 and 9, when then Pope Benedict the, the 16th called for the year of St. Paul. When that was announced, it was taking most people by surprise. And when people like experts, theologians, biblical scholars were interviewed, I took a, a special interest in listening to them explain why is it that there seems to be a, a, a space between St. Paul and ordinary Catholics, cradle Catholics. You know, uh, one particular scholar spoke about how Paul usually gets lip service, even from Catholic priests and theologians. And, and why is that? Well, his writings are, you know, challenging to say the least. I'm reminded of what St. Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3 about his, about his friend. I, it's a glorious testimony, but listen carefully. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter says, so also our beloved brother Paul. First of all, notice that, a beloved brother there was no hostility or opposition between Peter and Paul. So also our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, the wisdom from on high, the wisdom of God, speaking of this as he does in all his letters. So they were already being gathered into a collection by the, the time that St. Peter was nearing the end of his life. There are some things in them, that is the letters of Paul, that are hard to understand which I think might be the understatement of the entire New Testament canon. <laughs> you know, it's been said by Adolf von Harnack, a Protestant church historian, quote, one might write a history of dogma as a history of the reactions to Paul's writings in the church. And in doing so, he would touch upon all of the turning points of church history. You know, you, you, you look at uh, Marcion and the Gnostics, the Apostolic Fathers, Irenaeus, Clement, going all the way through the Middle Ages up through the Protestant Reformation. You know, it's always been an ongoing discussion or debate about what did Paul mean? And already back in the first century, St. Peter testifies the fact that there is wisdom, gold in them are hills, but there are also some things in them that are hard to understand. And Peter doesn't add, you know, for the hoi polloi, you know, for the lower life, you know, for him too, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction. Hmm. The more things change, the more they stay the same, huh? As they do the other scriptures, graphe. What did Peter just say? That there are these letters that have been gathered or collected, and he refers to them as having wisdom, but they're also difficult to understand and the ignorant and the foolish twist them to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. So from our very first Pope, and not just from his lips, but from his pen, we discover that Paul's letters had been written, had been gathered and collected. And though there was no formal canonization just yet, nevertheless, Peter can just characterize them as scripture. Wow. I mean, that is glowing testimony to be sure. 
And so, again, we can ask ourselves the question, why is there this space or this distance between ordinary Catholics and St. Paul's writings? Because they're not easy. And because they've been hijacked, they've been misrepresented, they've been weaponized, you know, by heretics who tried to divide the church going back to the first century, the second century, and really from there on. And so I, I think we have to recognize something that Frank Sheed, another convert, Catholic apologist in the 20th century said, you know, he, he speaks about the Reformation in particular and how the Bible was used as a kind of anti-Catholic weapon, sola scriptura, the Bible alone, you know, and how the attack on Catholic doctrine did not destroy the Catholic attachment to the doctrines, but it sensibly weakened the Catholic attachment to the Bible. A man can never feel quite the same about even the nicest book if he has just been beaten around the head with it. <laughs> I, think, I think Frank Sheed knows what he's talking about. And so the, he goes on, he concludes, the scriptural insufficiency of Catholics is the last heritage of the Reformation still to be liquidated. But liquidated it must be, for how necessary indeed is scripture for the life of Catholics, as St. Jerome indicated long ago with his phrase, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. So I want to invite you as Catholics and perhaps as non-Catholics to rediscover St. Paul, to reappropriate him, to allow him to sow the seeds of God's word, the power of that word that comes through the Holy Spirit to really reignite the rocket fuel of grace within your soul so that you can begin to experience conversion, not only in an ongoing way, but in an ever deepening more and more deeply. And I think you can do this by drawing closer to St. Paul, to his life in the book of Acts and the three missionary journeys that lead to his house arrest there in Rome in the final chapter of Acts 28, where even under house arrest, he's using that as an opportunity to proclaim the gospel to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles as well, and inevitably to share the gospel with the household of Caesar himself. You know, it's very exciting. But besides the, the life of St. Paul described by St. Luke, his companion, I also want to encourage you to kind of get down and dirty in these letters that are admittedly difficult. Uh, he's not a biographer of Jesus like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He really is the first theologian and the only theologian of the first century to write, you know, some say 13, maybe 14 of the, the 27 books, so over half, possibly, you know, but he's, you know, he's taking these things deeper and deeper. You know, I'm reminded of a professor I had who was himself a graduate of Harvard with a PhD in theology, and, and he said that if Paul had applied his mind to, say, philosophy, he would have surpassed Plato and Aristotle. And at the time, you know, I'm thinking, oh, that's just exaggeration. Now, in my early 60s, having spent about 50 years of my life studying all of this, I realize that may be an understatement. It really is a remarkable thing for this treasury of divine wisdom to be available to us in the writings of Paul. But I want to end on a practical note because I must say that Paul has become not only my inspiration, and that goes all the way back to when I was turning 14. And I got a set of tapes on 1 Corinthians by Addison Leach, this brilliant biblical scholar, theologian, who just walked us through the book of 1 Corinthians. And he just made Paul come alive. And so I entered into a, a conversation, a dialogue, a kind of friendship that over the years has deepened and matured. So I really do see him as my hero. I mean, not alongside of Jesus. He's not on par with him. Of course, he would be the first to forswear that. But really, I mean, he could say to the Corinthians, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so he really is a model. But, you know, I'm reflecting now upon the friendship that was struck up between St. Paul on the one hand and Luke on the other. 
You know, there was a recent movie, Paul, Apostle of Christ, one of my favorites. And I wasn't really expecting to like it because, you know, I come with low expectations to religious movies or Catholic movies. But this one was really something special. Jim Caviezel starred in that, too, um, as uh, Luke, in fact. But as I reflect upon the friendship of Paul and Luke, I just want to draw out two or three points before we conclude because it starts really in chapter 16 of Acts, where we begin the we section of Acts, where suddenly, you know, Luke begins to use the first person plural pronoun, we. It's subtle, but it's stunning in its subtlety because he just kind of introduces himself into the narrative, but it's a clear marker of the beginning of a very special relationship, a friendship. In fact, Paul, for his part, mentions Luke fairly frequently. The earliest mention is in Philemon, where he ends up by speaking of Luke as among my fellow workers. That's high praise, but nothing like what we find in Colossians 4. In Colossians 4, he refers to Luke as his dear friend and the physician, or we sometimes summarize that as Luke, the beloved physician. I love that. You know, and you also hear in 2 Timothy 4, verse 11, Luke alone is with me. Here is Paul in prison. You know, even his friends have abandoned him. Some have turned against him. Luke alone is with me. Luke alone, indeed. That's friendship. And again, it isn't something that Luke talks about anywhere in Acts. It just picks up in the we sections in the second half of chapter 16. But I want to emphasize how Paul's friendship with Luke was unique. How do we see it? Well, he refers to his companions, Titus and Timothy, as his sons. 1 Timothy 1.18 and Titus 1.14, whereas Luke he calls a friend, beloved, loyal, to the end, he alone is with me. And so there really is a sense in which you're seeing two sides of one coin. Luke alone remains. Together, the two of them, Paul and his protege Luke, accomplish what no one man could ever do on his own. For instance, Luke wrote two of the books in the New Testament. Okay, compared to 14, what is that? Well, step back and analyze, because Luke's gospel is simply the longest book of all the New Testament books. And in second place is Luke's sequel, The Acts of the Apostles. I don't want to get bogged down in numbers, but in fact, you have Luke's gospel weighing in at over 19,000 words and Acts over 18,000 words for a grand total of nearly 38,000. And if you take all of Paul's letters, 13, or even if you add Hebrews, the, th the, the count only goes up to 37,460. And so Luke writes the two longest letters or books of the New Testament. Paul writes 14, the most in number. And when you combine Luke and Paul, you end up with well over half of the New Testament written by two men, the closest of friends. This is true collaboration. They didn't just travel together. They suffered together. And as you look at the early church fathers, they speak of Luke's gospel as, quote, Paul's gospel because of their companionship. You know, the friendship of Luke and Paul, I think, is the wellspring, the source of grace, not only back in the first century in a truly unique way, but now up until the 21st century as well. Again, I want to emphasize this. Through friendship, Paul and Luke accomplished what no man could do singularly separately. This is the power, not only of a particular friendship, but this is the power of friendship itself. When you think about what Jesus told the apostles in the upper room, he says, I no longer call you servants, I now call you friends, John 15, 15. Friendship with God? That was unimaginable for Plato and Aristotle and others. Well, because it was unattainable. It was humanly impossible. But what we can't do in the flesh is precisely what God has done through his son in the spirit, katapanuma. He's entered into the human race for us to enter into a share of divine life. 2 Peter 1.4, we have been made partakers of the divine nature. That isn't just a creator-creature relationship that goes beyond the master-slave that becomes father-son, but it also becomes the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. There's a fraternal bond. There is divine friendship. You know, again, if we could 
look at this through the eyes of ancient philosophers, or if we could look at this through the eyes of postmodern thinkers, we would watch their brains explode. I mean, this is mind-blowing. Seriously. Friends with God? Aristotle said, would have said, you know, that's metaphysically impossible because friendship requires equality. But that's exactly what the incarnation and the paschal mystery of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection has brought about. It adds nothing to him, but it adds everything to us. What is it? We can say partakers of the divine nature, but cut to the chase, it's friendship. And so if friendship is the core of the gospel, if friendship is the content of what is proclaimed as a result of what Jesus has done, then friendship ought to be the medium as well as the message. And so we have exhibit A, Paul and Luke. This friendship becomes the launching pad, not only for over half of the New Testament, but for the next 2,000 years, a supernatural enrichment of mind and heart of body and soul, of male and female, of Jews and Christians. I mean, everybody has something to draw, including you. So I want to encourage you not only to re-familiarize yourself with Paul's, you know, thought through his writings or his life through Luke's account in the Acts of the Apostles, but beginning today and continuing beyond the feast, I want you to ask St. Paul to enter into a friendship with him, to help you to enter into a close friendship with him. Uh, I, I believe that our Lord wants this. I believe that our Lady wants this. In the year of St. Joseph, I'm convinced St. Joseph is invisibly present behind me saying, amen, share that, Scott, you know. And so if you think about this friendship, you know, in... 3 John, verse 15, we discover that the term friendship becomes practically synonymous for the church and for the faith. And so live this out by deepening your friendships with other brothers and sisters in Christ and those who are potential brothers and sisters in Christ, but also use this feast day as an occasion for entering into a deeper friendship with St. Paul and St. Luke, asking them through their prayers to teach you to fall in love with our Lord through their writings. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for your Son and for the power of the gift of the Holy Spirit and how your Son made himself known to Saul and called him to become the apostle to the nations, called him to, to write these inspired letters that are so deep, so inexhaustibly wise, practical, and profound. And through the intercession of his friend, St. Luke, we ask you to conform us to Christ just as you conformed Paul. That we may imitate Paul as he imitated Christ. Hear us on this special feast of the conversion of St. Paul and make us more and more pleasing to you. For we ask this in the strong, holy, and powerful name of Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Paul, pray for us. And St. Luke, the beloved physician, pray for us also. God bless you all and happy feast day.